Okay, we uh, start up again. <coughs> As you can see from this FTCS uh, scheme simulation, it's not so stable. He's trying to do what he's supposed to. So the initial density here, one half, and then uh, 1.25 density then is rushing in, but we get a lot of, lot, lot of noise, so, so this uh, we can't really use. And uh, it doesn't help. Smaller and smaller delta T doesn't make it more stable. So uh, FTCS scheme, no, we can't really use it. So we crash that, that one, and then we take the same code, save as gas, and of course upwind. First order upwind scheme, they are very stable. So we redo it, first order uh, upwind. <coughs> Who's going to be upwind? Let's see. <coughs> so this is actually the reason why I wrote the equations on, on this form. I want a velocity in front of a spatial derivative. So here I have a density. So although this one is an x, more or less, is you don't get an upwind from him, but here. That's a uh, term that we can create an upwind. Depending on the, on the sign of the velocity, how should we create a derivative? And the momentum equation, oh yes, we have velocity in front of a derivative. So here, we have to check him. What will that mean in our uh, stencil here? Well, here, I have a velocity in front of the spatial derivatives. That was this one. So we have to investigate, is this positive or negative? Then should we write him as i plus 1 minus i or i minus i minus 1, depending on uh, the sign of the velocity. For him, we have to check the sign here and then have decide how to create a derivative. So this one is going to be changed, this one is going to be changed. But the rest of the code is the same. No changes whatsoever except these terms. So how do we do this? <coughs> Start with the uh, density, that's where we had the average velocity in front of it, in front of a term. So now I will create a u average equal. And then I copy this one and move it up here and divide by 2. So there I now have the local velocity in front of uh, the last term in the continuity equation. And then, sadly, <coughs> we need an if sentence. You should never use if sentences inside a loop. If sentence use a lot of CPU, this is going to be a slow code. But here, I don't care. I want a solution. We can do it smart afterwards if necessary. If this u average <coughs> is positive. Then how should we write the, uh, the uh, derivative? <coughs> and how should we write if it's not positive, if it's negative? So we should look something like this. Let's uh, write it. Uh, if you have trouble with uh, uh, the tabulators here, you don't get it nicely instead of <laughs> printing a lot of spaces and uh, moving them around. You mark everything, control A, and then you print control I. Automatically use uh, the correct intent 
then everything will be correct. So control I, if you are marked as uh, something, then he will do the proper in out for the different for uh, or nested if or whatever. So that's a good idea. Let's see here. We now need the velocity, of course, u average. So if he was positive, then we should uh, take i and i minus 1. We should go upwind. So then we remove him. And then we don't need this divide by 4 anymore. First of all, I have one half up here already. The other half, the other two, that was uh, the central scheme. I plus 1 minus I minus 1. Now I only have one single delta x under. So the 4 shouldn't be there. So that's the recipe if u average is positive. If it's negative, okay, then we have to go the other way around. Then we need i plus 1 minus i. i plus 1 minus i. So that should now be the correct first order upwind scheme for the continuity equation. Everybody with me on that one? Yeah. Then the momentum equation, we have to do the same. There, we don't have to create a u average. The uh, convective term is this one. I have a velocity in front already, so we just have an if sentence for him. If u of i, if he is positive, then we do it like this. Else and end, control I, control E, and then we have it here. Now let's see, U is positive, then this derivative here should not be divided by 2, and it should be I minus I minus 1. So just remove the plus 1 here, and remove divided by 2. That's it. Copy this one for the other version. U is negative, then we create a derivative upwind. U i plus 1 minus U i. That's it. Let's see if that one runs. Now I have a way too small delta t, so we increase him a little bit and try. Ah, that looks a little bit better. Absolutely. Um, when you just use plot, of course, he will rescale the window every time. So here you can do something like this. Mm, plot. And then you plot, in addition, a straight line, say from 0 to say from 0 to 3, something like that. Then you will bring the scale with you inside the plot sentence, just to avoid using axis all the time. So uh, that should help. Let's, let's have a look if it looks OK. So you see 0, the end of the tube, initial density and goes one half a cell too far inside the wall, the ghost cell. And if we run, yeah, it looks rather nice actually. And also he stops quite nicely when uh, he has hit uh, sort of the bottom. If we continue, we can do that. Just say uh, the maximum time now is two times. Then you should go in and then you should go back again, shouldn't you? Let's see. He goes in, goes out. Ah, but then uh, he wasn't so happy going the other way. 
So uh, this uh, maybe not the best uh, method, but uh, at least on the way in he looked rather promising. Now I have only 20 cells. If we increase the resolution, 40 cells. Yeah, we get the same quite nicely actually. So uh, yes, the upwind uh, scheme at least looks uh, promising. Now we know first order upwind is a very diff diffusive scheme and uh, frankly should never be used, but uh, sometimes as you see we really have no, have no options. So uh, yes, it doesn't look uh, too stupid. The uh, stability I won't go into the stability analysis for a coupled equation system. Two equations have to be solved together, it's ra rather messy. So here we can play around with delta t of course, bigger delta t. <coughs> oh yes, he explodes quite rapidly. So uh, a little trial and add it instead as a stability should be, should be okay. <coughs> Any questions to uh, to this one? <coughs> this was only the density. We can plot the velocity as well. Then the velocity clearly is going negative. So then I rescale here a little bit. Say from uh, minus one. And then I plot u divided by the speed of sound. So uh, the local velocity shouldn't be larger than the speed of sound, hopefully. I use the same x, it's not entirely correct, because he should have a position of his own. He's half a cell away from the densities, but I don't care. So then we do the same down here, plotting x, u, and then we go all the way down to minus 1. So let, oops, that was u divided by c, thank you. Let's see how he looks. <coughs> initially, velocity is 0 inside uh, the tube. And here, the initial density, and then we start. So you see, you have an inrush of uh, of flow, velocity goes negative, constant. Uh, the boundary condition, the, that one then remember is half a cell wrong, so he should be moved half a cell uh, to the right here, so it's actually zero exactly where he should be. <coughs> if we now continue in time, we can do that. Going further in time, you'll see the velocity will, will go zero when he goes the other way, but not, not clearly. So definitely something is unstable when he rushes out again. So um, what I tried initially here was to state that uh, solution of these simple equations, that can't be a problem. Yes, it turns out it can be a problem. They are not so easily solved. Using simple FTCS, that was unstable no matter what we did. Uh, first order upwind, you can get uh, a little bit ahead, but you also run into problems. So, how to solve this one more correct? Well, I won't go through the details there. Then I will uh, jump a little too far ahead, but I will show you more advanced solution here something that is called the Rusanov method which uh, uh, Professor Miller is going to teach you later on uh, not for a system but for one equation so you see this later on and uh, it's a little bit uh, more advanced so uh, but still, here it's a first order Euler step in time. So it's still very, very simple. 
but we have some additional uh, uh, parameters we then have to play around with. And also you see no if sentences inside here. That's uh, very, very important indeed. So if we now plot the same problem, I think I have 40 here initially, one half. And the t maximum is 1 over c. So let's have a look at this one. Much smoother, much nicer. So here is a question of the correct time. He was actually started to go back again. So this uh, simple analysis I did was claiming that he should hit the bottom after so and so long time at the speed of sound. That might not be correct. I mean, he got a little further. So uh, it's a question here if my time development is correct. Uh, also, does he move with uh, what speed? Does he move with the speed of sound or what? Well, if you now start playing around with the initial density here, I said it was one half. So there is a question, can I take zero? In my versions, I couldn't, I divided by density. So, uh, but with this method, Not a problem. But then you also see you get a much higher density here when he hits, uh, uh, hits the bottom. Of course, very high pressure. High density equals high pressure. So it's a question uh, actually for the driving force in, in your problem. Here is a density difference which then you can recalculate as a pressure difference. If it's strong enough, then you will have a strong shock wave. If it's not so strong, then you, will, you won't have a shock, then he will move slower. So if we say he is, uh, say, 1, then the density difference inside the tube and outside is only 0.25. It's not that big, uh, not that big a deal, and you see he moves quite differently. <coughs> Going back to a stronger one, yeah, we can take uh, zero, that's okay. And then you take for many times, or for a longer time. This will now also be a control of the code. Ah, there he exploded. Why did he do that? I didn't ask him to do that. <coughs> so we need a smaller delta t. Okay. 0.5. Smaller delta t or fewer cells. That's also a trick. <coughs> Let's see if he's stable now. <coughs> So you know the steady state situation. In the end, when the air has rushed in, wave go back again, you should settle so that you have a zero, uh, zero velocity inside and the density should be constant equal to the surrounding density of 1.25. <coughs> so now he should start leveling off. But you see, you have to simulate for a, uh, quite a long time, actually, to, to get it. But he will, uh, he will get there. So that's a good control here of your uh, code, that you find the correct steady state in the end. <coughs> a little discussion about the explosion, the instability here. Stop him, and we go back to the time step that we had. How can you check? I mean, this is something that's going to occur uh, from time to time. Your code explodes. Sadly, he explodes after a long, long, long time. If he explodes immediately, then you've done something stupid. But if he, he sort of crashes after a long, long time, 
then it could be nice to have a possible way of detect when are you when have you crashed instead of just everything just uh, mm, yeah comes up with an error uh, message so here he crashed after when was it uh, he was trying to go back again and then and then you see he still calculates but the answers are clearly way off. And if you look at some of these numbers, you get uh, sort of a hint here. There's read none. What's none? None, that's not a number. And yes, you can detect if you want. Do we have some nones in your simulation? Uh, if you have one parameter becoming not a number, I mean, you have divided by zero or it has exploded. Any other number touching that, added to it, multiply it with it or something, will also become none. So it's sort of a virus going through your, all, your, all your unknowns. So here, if we now test, what did I test? I think I tested uh, uh, on the velocity. Yeah. I mean, you could print it out and then you can see for yourself. Yes, they are indeed not a number, actually all of them. No, oh, except the first one. That's the boundary condition. So here's zero, but the rest has exploded. So how can you test it? Well, <coughs> you can do something like this. If, and then you say the sum of all your uh, use, uh, sorry, the sum of is nam of u. <coughs> is nam, that is a logical operator. Is it not a number or not? If it is, then it is true. But true in, uh, in MATLAB, that means one. So here I add all this, is it not a number or not? If everybody is zero, then the sum will be zero and I, it will be okay. But if this sum is then positive, then I have at least one, not a number. And then I want to stop. How to stop? You could have uh, said uh, mm, the time variable n up here equal to a very big number and then he will stop or simply write break break he will then jump out of the loop that he is inside and then of course he will stop so that is sort of a nice control for uh, has my code exploded if then stop or if, then you can do something else instead of just everything crashes. So uh, test for is none. The sum of this uh, vector is not that hard, so uh, that shouldn't uh, be any problems. It shouldn't take too much CPU to find it. Um, when it crashes, I would now be interested in what is the uh, QRA number. Remember the QRA number? You are not allowed to have a delta t so big that sh with your local velocity you go further than one single cell. So what is your local uh, QRA number here? Well, we need uh, velocity multiplied with delta t and divided by, uh, by delta x, which is the same as our uh, r. But <coughs> I have a whole bunch of <coughs> these uh, velocities. So which one should I take? Well, I take the biggest one. Maximum of the absolute value, since they can go both negative and positive. There I will print out the biggest QRA number that I have. Let's, let's now just see what happens when he crashes. How big is that number? So. I'll let him crash. Whoops. I wanted to see that. Mm -hmm. There he crashed. And now you see the code stopped. 
And as you see, yes, we have a very big number. But of course, you could have stopped here if your density was bigger than a certain number. Totally unphysical, goes negative, of course, unphysical. You could have stopped using other things as well. Here, I just used the uh, not a number. And now we have a look at the Cura number. It went to infinity, very big, very big. And then you go up. And when does he explode? Here it really started to speed up. Up to this point, you have a Cura number smaller than one. As soon as he goes above one, he crashes very, very fast indeed. So the Cura number here clearly is the limit what we can do. So if we take 0.7, see if that helps. Ah, looks looks good. Seems to be running okay now. Let's have a peek at the Cura number. 0.2. So now we are sort of in the safe uh, region. The velocity is getting smaller and smaller. So uh, now it's not a problem anymore. But this is sort of an important point. This Cura number, you can't just check it once before you start the simulation, you have to check it for every velocity, for every delta x, for every time step. So it changes all the time. So it has to be investigated actually at every time step and in every location. If we do a rerun, you can see it better. The danger was... Ah, he hardly reached above 0.25. And now he was rather safe. A little bit higher. Ah, he survived there. No, there he crashed. <laughs> when he crashes, he goes really fast. So, so uh, maybe here. The Cura number smaller than one is enough. I haven't done the stability analysis for this problem. Okay, <coughs> I'll put out this uh, version for you so you can play around with it yourself. Should be uh, possible to understand it and you will get the theory later on. It's written on the form, uh, sort of a conservative form, continuity rho u and the next derivative and the momentum also in this conservative form rho velocity and here rho velocity squared and then uh, speed of sound square multiplied by rho it's a little different version but uh, also here I used now not a staggered mesh I used a co-located mesh so you have the density and the uh, velocity in the same locations but <coughs> you will see this more of this method later on. So next time we will investigate a little bit further into a shock. What is a shock? Clearly you will have a shock wave here when you have a strong enough uh, density difference inside uh, in the pipe. So the air is rushing in. And uh, next time we will do it a little bit more simple the simplest possible uh, looking at shocks and then we will look at uh, actually uh, car traffic S but that will be the topic for next time any questions <coughs> yep could you briefly outline what the staggered mesh is mm, a staggered mesh system is um, just different locations for your different unknowns. So here I had density and velocity. So it's your choice where you want to put the unknowns. 
collocated, you have everything in the same point. Staggered, you have them at a certain distance. Here, in my opinion, it was very natural to choose staggered mesh due to the boundary conditions and also due to the actual discretization. Uh, so, uh, staggered mesh is uh, widely used, actually. It's another reason for it when it comes to the entire Navier Stokes uh, using staggered mesh, something to do with stability and the pressure gradient here. You see the danger actually already here. You calculate a velocity. So here you have a cell and if all of your unknowns are in the same point, then you have a pressure here and you have a velocity at the same point. They are given at the same point. Now take the entire Navier Stoke and make a discrete version of it. Then when you are looking at this point, calculating a new velocity, you are going to need a pressure, uh, a pressure uh, gradient at that point. And using a central scheme, you then use the pressure at each side. So you will use pi plus one, you will use pi minus one. But the pressure where you are standing doesn't enter into the equations. That means you risk obtaining a solution that have two separate uh, pressure fields. Every even point will be one pressure field and every odd point would be a totally different pressure field. Uh, sort of a, a checkerboard pattern in, in two dimensions. So the black uh, uh, cells, they will have one solution for the pressure and the white will have a totally different uh, solution for the pressure. And they don't talk to each other at all. So that was the reason originally why they invented the staggered mesh. So they did it like this pressure in the center and then the velocity to the left. And then you see when you are focusing on the entire Navier stock, looking at a new velocity, then you need a pressure gradient, okay? Then you just take the pressure half a cell on each side. No problem there. Then you smooth it out or sort of coupled your uh, pressure with the velocity. So that was uh, sort of the history behind a staggered mesh system. But uh, absolutely possible to use in, in, in a lot of problems. Here I hadn't, uh, it wasn't sort of uh, a must to use it here, but uh, for me it was natural. Other questions? <coughs> then we stop here.